Hey, it's Mike here, and today, diverticulosis, which is abnormal intestinal wall pouches. We're gonna talk about diet, not just in terms of how it might cause it, but also about diets after people have this condition and the myths that people are often told about it. But we're gonna talk about the mechanisms proposed for how it could form initially, as well as the newer research on the gut microbiome and diverticulosis. And we're just gonna look at a bunch of research in general. And my goal is for this to be the best diverticulosis video on YouTube. Competition is stiff. Diver or diverticulosis and diverticulitis. The word diverticulosis means presence of pouches in the colon. I have at least one family member with diverticulosis, and so I grew up hearing the term diverticulitis, which has a slight difference. That's the complication of this condition, so we should just hit the basic terms right off the bat. We have three here. The first term here is diverticula, which is Dracula's less cool cousin. I'm joking. The diverticula is just the official name for those little pouches that bump out of the sides of the large intestine. Dracula might be cooler than me, but at least I am not as pale. Take that. And then having these is really the condition diverticulosis. When the pouches become inflamed, usually, but not always from infection, it gains the itis, like bronchitis, for example, and becomes diverticulitis. And I have to say, I try to use the PG rated images for you guys, but I end up looking through on Google images of, you know, like the actual raw stuff that you don't wanna see. Let's just say if you have trypophobia, which is fear of like a collection of holes uh, from those internal views, uh, don't Google it. <laughs> and if you are scared of holes, just remember that we essentially are one big hole from our mouth out through the other side. <laughs> so let's not get holier than thou if you don't have this condition. So anyway, enough kidding around. This is where this disease gets unique and that the highest prevalence that we know of is in the US and you might have some guesses as to why. And to show how common it is, it's the third most common discharge diagnosis among hospital admissions in the US. And nearly 60% of people over the age of 60 have have it. However, under the age of 40, it's closer to 10%. And it's a pretty costly disease when it progresses to that diverticulitis, when you have those complications, that inflammation. Uh, between the outpatient and inpatient admissions, we're talking it costing $2 billion or more. <laughs> Oh, so what about the cause here? And the general theories have a lot to do with pressure, though there's some nuance there. And so if diverticulosis had its own theme song, it would be Under Pressure by David Bowie. Under pressure, pushing down on me, pooping down on me, that have a This video has been removed due to copyright because that cover was so accurate and good. For you to eliminate hard stool, you gotta strain. Mm -hmm. When you strain, that's gonna increase the pressure inside the colon. Right. And that is what can cause diverticulosis. Yeah, we're simply talking about high mechanical pressure pushing out on the wall of your intestines, which I will say, you know, a part of it, not all of it. Well, to Johns Hopkins, they say constipation is the main cause of greater pressure in your colon. When you're constipated, your muscles strain to move the stool that is too hard. The extra pressure from the straining makes the weak spots in your colon bulge out. That's the diverticula. So we have constipation as an issue. What can be the cause of that? Well, we have from this paper how, well, it's common in Western countries. It's super rare to have diverticulosis in rural Asia and Africa, but increases with urbanization. Is it the pressure of city life? No, it's not that pressure. It's likely that shift from high fiber diet to low fiber diet. One study found that those who ate the most fiber versus the lowest fiber had a 41% lower risk of getting diverticulosis. And this is where, you know, I have the word vegan in my name on this channel. I just have to mention this study that found that, well, vegetarians had about a 27% lower risk of diverticular diseases. Uh, vegans had a 72% lower risk, which is wild. So yeah, as one of those studies authors concluded, consuming a vegetarian diet with high fiber intake was associated with a lower risk of hospital admission or death from diverticular disease. So right off the bat, it seems like there's something obvious going on here. You're getting more fiber, you're not getting as constipated, you're not having to push those hard stools, but it's more than that. And that brings us to the gut microbiome and newer studies on that. As this paper mentions, quote, dysbiosis plays a central role in the etiopathogenesis or the starting of the disease of diverticula and symptom development. 
The main hypothesis here appears to believe that when we have sort of little sections of pathogenic bacteria causing inflammation, they create a spot, which leads to more or less a weak spot in the smooth muscle wall of your intestine. And over time, the pressure can push that out a little bit, more inflammation, more pressure, and that bad bacteria working together to make these little pouches. And get this, one study in particular here even found that a type of bacteria was associated with diverticulosis and also that higher bile acid levels were, and this bacteria feeds off bile acids, as I've recently mentioned, uh, eating like a high animal fat diet increases bile acids. I mean, we see a seven fold difference in bile acid levels between like, Rural Africans and African Americans. This bacteria is Bilophila wadsworthia and the abundance of wadsworthia on an animal-based diet was considered to support a link between dietary fat, bile acids, and the outgrowth of microorganisms capable of triggering inflammatory bowel disease. And on that note, it's time to take a quick break with today's sponsor, Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, which is a prebiotic and a probiotic with 53.6 billion active bacterial cell units from 24 different strains scientifically shown to support various areas of health, including your gut barrier, gut immunity, overall digestive health, cardiovascular skin health, and more. Well, I've covered a ton of those topics with the actual scientific research on strains in a seed. In terms of diverticulosis, we don't have that research yet, but as that previous paper mentioned, dysbiosis is one of the key starting factors of diverticulosis and of course isn't gonna help when it comes to getting diverticulitis. And so anything we can do to combat that, to balance out our bacteria is key. One huge connection here, as John Hopkins mentioned, is that constipation leading to increased wall pressure. Obviously you don't want to be constipated, even in life in general. And we actually do have studies on strains in seed showing better ease of expulsion and increased bowel movement frequency in people with constipation, which is amazing, randomized control trial. And Lindy and I have been taking seeds since 2021 now, three years and a loving it. Lindy in particular, as I always say, is all about it. And so if you would like to give it a try, of course, just click the link below and use the code Mike25, that's M-I-C-25 for 25% off your first month's supply. All right. But we should get more into the specifics of why a vegan diet could be helping here or just why certain dietary trends help. The first, of course, is that fiber consumption. From the Million Women study, which I guess was 690,000 people, these are women that started out with no diverticular disease, and then they followed them for several years and saw who got it, who was eating what, and they found that for each five grams a day of fiber consumption, there was a 14% lower risk of getting diverticular disease and cereal and fruit fiber was the most associated with lower risk. That sort of implies that if you just eat enough fiber, you're gonna have a 0% risk. Do they have a Metamucil IV yet? Work on that, Metamucil. Except I actually probably get that level of fiber anyway, eating whole plant foods. There's another aspect of a vegan diet which is very likely to help, and that is what we've seen, you know, the lower heart disease burden, the lower LDL cholesterol, healthier arteries, or even studies where we've seen improvement in heart disease condition. And that brings us to, as this paper mentions, we have these arteries in our intestinal wall, and over time, as they become impaired or clogged. We already have a weak spot there, but it can get even weaker and create a point where you can get bulging as well. And they mentioned that high blood pressure could be playing a role here as well, whether that's just with the atherosclerosis or more. And it was the case that people with high blood pressure had like twice the risk of diverticulosis. And it goes without saying that people on a vegan diet have like 50 to 75% lower rates of hypertension or high blood pressure. So, you know, it's working from multiple angles here to reach that 70 2% lower risk. But I think it's good to cover both sides. And in my search through the research, I did find one contradictory study here. That's this one saying that actually fiber didn't help. Higher levels were not good. In fact, slightly bad. This is an outlier, goes against everything else. And it is the case that once they adjusted for things, it became bad. Before that, it wasn't statistically significant. And they did adjust for BMI, which I think is a little bit sketchy here. And that's because a standard American diet could causally push you to have high BMI, 
as well as having diverticular disease. So if you're adjusting that BMI down, you could also be shifting and distorting the actual statistical view here. But yeah, other studies, I'll add another one here, show more fiber equals lower risk of these diverticular diseases. And this isn't just about prevention. This is also about people who are also already having this disease and the risk that they have of going to the hospital. Fiber from fruit and vegetables can also significantly reduce the overall risk of hospitalization, in particular about 30% lower hospitalization for high versus low intake of that fiber. And that's why you wanna look at a bunch of different studies instead of just looking at one and coming to a conclusion. And along the lines of people who already have diverticulosis, They've for sure been told, or at least heard, that they should probably stay away from you know, nuts and seeds that could get stuck in there and irritate it. Well, what does the science say on that? That's what my one family member followed for like their entire life. Was it worth all of that trouble? Well, this study that followed middle-aged men for 20 years found, get this, an inverse relationship between nut and popcorn consumption and the risk of diverticulitis. They say that the study was instrumental in putting to rest the nut, seed, corn, and popcorn hypothesis. Therefore, avoidance of these foods is no longer recommended. And that kind of makes sense because the very fiber-rich foods that are not only associated with lower risk of getting these diseases, but also lower risk of getting hospitalized from these diseases, don't fall into that category that you're not supposed to eat nuts, seeds, things like that. Well, I understand intuitively, it seems like they could be a risk, but it's not showing that they are in the literature. And personally, I, the great diverticula, loves. I love to eat nuts and seeds, actually. Yeah, so feed me. There's also a really interesting sort of phenomenon where diverticula, those pouches, are generally more common in the left colon, except in Asian countries where they're more common in the right colon. I mean, I know it's obviously because they're like on the other side of the world. That's that's how anatomy and science works. No, uh, if you have a hypothesis about this, I would be interested. I have some thoughts of how it could be, but let me know in the comments down below what you think about that. I think it's really interesting. So yeah, in the end, whole plant foods, higher fiber diets, and vegan diets in particular, massively lower the risk of these diverticular diseases. I mean, 72% is nothing to squawk at. That's not the right saying, but you get the idea. I also think how our gut bacteria might be playing a role. It's super interesting with those high animal fat, bile acid related bacteria creating an issue. And of course, speaking of the gut, if you would like to try Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic, just click the link below and use the code MIKE25 at checkout. All right, that's it for today. Feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.